But now I'm really, really excited to have HP here. Uh, it's very funny whenever I say your name, uh, people literally are like, but HP, where, where is this HP? <laughs> because they think about the other HP. But thanks a lot for joining again. It was really wonderful to get to know you at the last workshop. And uh, come on up on stage. The stage is yours and your time is running. All right. Well, I will try to go through it fast. Uh, if possible to not keep you guys too long from the wonderful view. So this talk is about uh, MSAP1, a project started by Eric Drexler about a year ago. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to create high quality free and open source tooling for the nano engineering community. Impor uh, most importantly, uh, develop an interoperable way for, for you guys to share your code with each other and and the, the work you're doing. So a lot of the time as y'all are well aware of, I'm imagining, is that uh, most of the time tooling that gets created for a particular type of research gets created by an undergrad or a, or a PhD student. The, the thesis is done and they move on and now you're left with a piece of code that you have to maintain yourself. And probably what that means is that next year's PhD student will write their own, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, at infinium with slight, slight inc incremental changes. Of course, these tools are also written to work on like your computer and not someone else's computer. So frequently, it's like very difficult to share these tools with other people in the community. So another goal is to create a class of what we call citizen engineers by making sure that the tooling that you guys use for your science is actually available for the general public as well, for free as well. And this hopefully will help us generate a library of components to build nano machines with that have been tested and vetted by real science, but not necessarily all designed by scientists. Hopefully some of these will be designed by just interested, interested third parties. Part of this is to help you build these tools that I just talked about and not have to be experts in UX and UI. Like right now, Python, uh, sorry, Jupyter Notebooks have taken some of this pain away, but there's still like no like standard around these things. Everyone, uh, everyone's uh, uh, artistic abilities to build these UIs is variable. So what we're trying to do is make that easier to integrate into a more cohesive whole. Furthermore, the plugins that we, the plugin system that we've uh, developed for MSEP1 uses isolated environments for all of these plugins. So you don't have to like be a systems expert any longer to figure out, okay, I want to install the plugin one and plugin two, but like plugin one requires like OpenMM version 1.2.3 exactly. And this other one requires 1.4.5 exactly. And it absolutely cannot work cross purposes. So now you either have to find someone to port either one of those plugins to the other version or just start running virtual machines or just not have both plugins installed at the same time. So the other thing is creating games to create these citizen engineer class of people. And to do this, we are designing game content that is actually scored using the same scientific tooling that you use for your real work. So basically this is sort of a uh, think like Kerbal Space Program, which has like fairly realistic like orbital mechanics and, uh, and things like that. Uh, but lay people use this to play with, but it can sometimes actually come up with interesting things. Like Kerbal Space Program is sometimes actually used by space agencies to test something with, right? So we're trying to kind of write that same line. And I see that my image is over the text. My apologies. Another thing there, the thing F behind the spaceship there was Lego Mindstorm. <laughs> that was kind of the idea that we're, that we're putting. So again, the idea is that we get like regular users using real science tools to basically play with at the same time. So the sort of like big pie in the sky vision that we have for, for the project as a whole is to kickstart this development of atomically pre precise engineering, kind of like what you're talking about with uh, your system, but actually have like a library of parts, a library of designs available to actually work towards. Because right now we're we're in this situation where people kind of think that having this would be great, but we don't know how to get there. But also we don't really know that if we did get there, what exactly kind of machines we would be building. So the kind of interest in spending as much resources that was probably necessary in order to get to us to the atomically precise engineering. So we have this sort of like vicious cycle thing. So we're trying to break through that vicious uh, uh, cycle by allowing people to design these things simulate and test them, see what they would be like if we could build them, 
and this way hopefully creating the incentives to spend more resources on actually figuring out how to build them. I think I've maybe have gone through the slides a little bit faster than I thought. Well, I'll just go on. So this is the, the base editor. We have some very simple uh, systems for just building molecules kind of like you're, uh, like you're expecting. We have this uh, idea of a context menu essentially, which has the, uh, the current state of the program in it. So you can fairly easily and quickly switch between different uh, pages of, uh, of functionality. Let me open one of the more interesting looking ones. So we have these interesting looking mechanical machines. I don't know who made this. Is Eric. Eric Drexler did, right? I don't know how much time he spent on it. I don't know how recent this was as well. We have like various representations. So this whole thing is built in a game engine called Godot 4. The uh, rendering is all done using like modern uh, GPU techniques. So for instance, we render all of these uh, atoms by basically uploading the atoms locations and bonds directly to the GPU. And then the GPU generates all of these geometry around it. It is quite effective and it doesn't like take a lot of round trips between the GPU and the CPU in order to display things. So we can actually display quite a lot of atoms without slowing down too much on, on existing hardware. So we have a couple of USB sticks with the software, the current version of the software on it. If you're interested in helping us being a lab mouse on sort of like using the interface, features you like, features you hate, things like that, please come see us and we'll give you like a short little introduction on what you can expect and uh, we'll give you a USB stick and we would be very grateful if you could talk to us about what you're using it for and what uh, kind of extra features you're gonna need. Just generally speaking, just during this conference and maybe afterwards, if there's no time here, we would love to talk to people who currently write science integrations using things like OpenMM, Sci4, other tools like that, uh, and, and what kind of tools you write right now for your work and how we can help you with our APIs in this tool to help you visualize the work uh, that you're already doing and, and things like that. And, well, funding always, of course. If you know of someone with spare cash to work on something like this, please let us know. <laughs> and I guess where are the questions now? Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, I did my best. <laughs> Question, Colin? Yes. Yeah, you said it's a free open source. Uh, where is it? Can we, is it something you can download on GitHub or? So it will be it will be on GitHub. The the current situation is because the plugin interface isn't done yet. We felt that giving it to the public right now and having people write plugins that it will probably not survive more than about half an hour or until the next <laughs> Git build wasn't too friendly. And we didn't want to ossify what people were doing yet. So that's why we're doing sort of like a limited release now to interested parties. Do you have a timeline for when it might be open sourced? So right now, the, the thing that's blocking it, like I said, is like the, the plugin interface. We're working on that like actively right now. So I'm thinking two, three months probably, and then it will just be a general release that everyone can just download. And hopefully by then we'll have gather some feedback from hopefully some of the people in this room and get like a really solid first release. No, but we should probably set one up. We will put one on the MSAP1 um, uh, domain. Uh, so I, I think it, it's great to try to encourage citizen science, and especially in new fields like this. So I was wondering, does this tool help people understand how molecular machines are very different from the macroscopic machines that we're used to? So I'm thinking things like there's constant thermal motion, that, or, and there's these ratchets that behave quite differently than our intuitions at larger scales would behave. Does a tool like this help? That so that aspect. is certainly our hope. So the, the hope is very much to, so we're not going to be simulating these machines using like just like rigid body, like Newtonian mechanics. That's not what we're gonna, we're gonna be using the, the nanoscale physics engines, molecular dynamics, sorry, that's the word I was, I was yeah. blanking on. We're gonna be using molecular dynamics to actually simulate these tools, uh, the, these machines. We're not using like a shortcut there. So the, the, the expectation is that people will understand that. So, so a user, for instance, could crank out the temperature. Yeah. yeah, yes. 
So one of the one of the things that we that we're hoping to achieve here is to have these like machine parts, like like I said, and characterize them using these sort of like different temperature ranges and sort of like finding the 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 breaking points and the the useful sort of like environment in which these these parts still function, right? So once we have characterized that, at that point we will probably just simulate them using more Newtonian uh, uh, mechanics. But at that point, we know sort of like the breaking point. So if you create a machine and you try to put the whole machine at like, I don't know, 10,000 degrees Kelvin or something like that, we know that none of the parts can survive that. So the, the, so the simulation of the entire machine also will not survive that, right? So that's kind of the approach we're taking there. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. My final question is, which of the architectures does this elevate? Probably well, we're hoping of all of them. Right? <laughs> we're, we're hoping it's all like of them. like a general purpose yeah. tool. Okay, wonderful. Thank oh, you so yeah, much. And we'll be talking some more about this like this evening, right? It's the thing that I was yeah. supposed to say. Tonight we're going to have after the dinner, like there'll be a time to do breakout drinks. So if you have any <laughs> demos to show, anything you want to teach people or anything you want to learn, there'll be a whiteboard uh, out for that. And then we have a little bit more time for like more in-depth conversation about this. Thank you very much, HP. Thank you.